Welcome to the Biomarine Second Quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. Hosting this conference call today from Biomarine is Tracy McCarthy, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Tracy. Thank you, Grace. Thank you all for joining us today. To remind you, this non-confidential presentation contains forward-looking statements about the business prospects of Biomarine Pharmaceuticals, including expectations regarding Biomarine's financial performance, commercial products, and potential future products in different areas of therapeutic research and development. Results may differ materially depending on the progress of Biomarin's product programs, actions of regulatory authorities, availability of capital, future actions in the pharmaceutical market, and developments by competitors, and those factors detailed in Biomarin's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, such as 10Q, 10K, and 8K reports. On the call today from Biomarin Management are J.J. Bienname, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Jeff Ager, Executive Vice President, Chief Commercial Officer, Hank Fuchs, President of Worldwide Research and Development, Greg Geyer, Executive Vice President, Chief Technical Officer, and Brian Mueller, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. We hope to keep the call today to one hour and give everyone a chance to ask a question, so we respectfully request that you limit yourself to one question during the Q&A portion of the call. Thank you for your understanding. I will now turn the call over to Byron's Chairman and CEO, J.J. Bienname. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we hope you, uh, your families are enjoying the summer. Uh, so we had a very strong, uh, very strong results in the first half of this year, uh, recording uh, $988 million in total revenues in the first six months of the year, and half a billion dollars uh, in total revenues in the second quarter alone, representing a 17% top-line year-over-year growth, including Cuba, uh, and 38% year-over-year -year growth in Q2, excluding Kuvan, which, as, as you know, has been facing generic competition in the U.S. since October of last year. These results underscore our ability to execute despite the impact of a global uh, pandemic, and more importantly, our testament to the value of our products uh, represents to patients. <clears throat> Based on this strong performance, we are pleased uh, to be raising our total revenue and bottom-line guidance for the year and Jeff and Brian will provide more details in a moment. With the commercial uh, business increasing steadily, uh, we look to the next generation of biomarine products to drive transformational growth in the coming years. With our late stage products, Voxogo and Roctavian, currently under review by health authorities, the R&D organization achieved a number of key goals in the first half of the year. In this quarter, Hank and his team advanced regulatory progress with both products setting up for four potential U.S. and European approvals, beginning with Voxogo in Europe uh, in, a, in the next few weeks, uh, hopefully by the end of next month. Uh, and actually, we are uh, going to start treating our first uh, commercial Voxogo patients in France imminently, uh, based on an early access program, which was approved the so-called ATU in France. Um, and Jeff will, uh, will give some more details uh, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a little while. Uh, so uh, we expect uh, EU approval to be followed by potential approval in the U.S. based on the current Purdue action date of November 21, and uh, discussions with the FDA are moving forward. Uh, with Rockavian, the recent, recent validation of the MAA and, and potential uh, CHMP opinion in the first half of 2022 paves the way for a third potential major market approval uh, in, uh, in the next 12 months upon completion of the two-year observation uh, uh, from all 134 patients in our pivotal generate one study with Roctavian. This will be the basis of a potential BLA submission next year in the U.S. We, uh, should the data be supportive, as we expect, uh, and, uh, and then anticipating a, a fourth major market approval is possible potentially in late 2022. The value proposition of Roctavia increases with each additional year of bleeding control as demonstrated. As we just shared at the recent ICH meeting, from our pivotal generate one study, over 90% of the 134 patients had an annualized bleeding rate of zero or lower uh, than baseline after four weeks following treatment with Roctavia. This is just with uh, one uh, intravenous infusion of Roctavia. 
Also, an ICH from our phase one, two study uh, following a single infusion of rocavian uh, through at least five years, we observed a 95% reduction in mean annualized bleeding rates to less than one bleed per year compared to uh, the bleed rates from participants previously treated with standard of care factor eight prophylaxis. Again, we're not comparing ourselves to placebo here, but we compare ourselves to still the current standard of care. So we are recognizing it has it's recognizing that it has to be determined how long Rotavian will demonstrate hemostatic efficacy. But we have reason to believe, uh, based on the current data, that bleeding control may be sustained for at least five years and beyond based on the current data. And while gene therapy is not curative, in terms it's not as lifetime apparently as unlikely to be lifetime therapy at this time, the value proposition Rotavian represents to patients and payers only strengthens with each year of data we are accumulating. To date, based on the five-year bleed control from our phase one, two study, at least $3.25 million uh, per patient has been spared for each patient in the clinical trial in the US. Uh, the, this, uh, this is based on the fact that in the US, recombinant factor eight uh, prophylactic therapy costs about $650,000 per year. So as you can imagine, payers will understand this kind of math very easily. So when considering value, we recently learned uh, from also from a, a review of some insurance claims of patients taking in Libra in the U.S. that many of them uh, are still uh, uh, using uh, recombinant factor eight despite treating with being treated with in Libra. And this is based on review of interest claims in the year 2020. This, is, uh, uh, this not only highlights the <clears throat> ongoing infusion burden with Imlibra, but the tremendous cost of potential dual therapy. Imlibra, which is quite therapy and can cost over $700,000 per year for patients, in addition to whatever factor the patients are taking. The bottom line is that the sustained, durable hemostatic efficacy observed following treatment with Roctavian in the longest and largest gene therapy trial ever done in hemophilia A positions Roctavian in a very attractive, as a very attractive treatment option to both patients and payers receiving approval in the US and in Europe. As we shared with you previously from a paper published by Croteau in 2019, the lifetime cost of factor eight prophylaxis alone and not, not including other aspects of the disease management and surgeries that the patients have to undergo on a regular basis. So the, the lifetime cost of factor eight prophylaxis alone is estimated in that paper to be, and other papers, to be between $28 million and $31 million. So obviously, if we price our product to five, between $2.5 and $3 million, we're not pricing our product as a lifetime cure. But more relevant to the value proposition for Octavian, Specifically, as noted in an ICER uh, report last year, um, ICER determined uh, that the value proposition for Octavian was around $2.5 million. Uh, and that was the cost effective threshold for the treatment with Octavian. And that was based only on three years of efficacy data. Now we have five years. So we are thrilled with the dramatic B control demonstrated with Octavian. And more than ever, we believe that it will be an important treatment choice based on ethical patients and cost savings for payers. As our next potential significant growth drivers, Roctavian and Voxogo have been a key focus and we expect will be transformational to BioRent upon potential approvals. But it is our next generation of early stage pipeline products that we look forward to unveiling in more details later this year. The bottom line value proposition <clears throat> reaches far beyond our strong based business and our near-term opportunities in hemophilia and achondroplasia. And we're excited to share more details with you at our upcoming R&D day in November of this year. So thank you uh, all for your continued support. And uh, I would like to turn the call over to Jeff to discuss the commercial business updates in more details. Thank you, JJ. I'm very pleased with the team's performance across all brands and all regions during the first half of the year. In the second quarter, we achieved $502 million in total revenues, representing 17% growth in the second quarter of 2021 compared to same period 2020. 
Significant growth concentrated in markets where customers place bolus orders specific to our enzyme replacement therapy brands drove strong sales in the first half of the year. Specifically, in the first and second quarters of 2021, large orders for naglazyme and bimazim from such markets as Turkey, Brazil, Egypt, Russia, and Saudi Arabia is expected to partially satisfy demand for those products in those regions in the second half of 2021. As a result, we expect a step down in volume in the second half of 2021 in those markets. Based on the strength of demand in the first half of the year and expectations for the remainder of 2021, we are raising full year guidance on total revenues, increasing Bimazim, Naglazyme, and Palanzit guidance, raising the bottom end of the range for Kuban, and reaffirming previously provided Brenura guidance. The detailed guidance updates are available on page four of today's press release. Beyond ordering dynamics, patient demand is another key indicator to pay attention to. For both Naglazyme and Bimazim, patient numbers increased more than 10% year over year, underscoring the essential nature of these important therapies. For Brunura in the second quarter, patients on therapy increased 33% year over year. Moving to Palanzee, where year over year growth of 45% translated to $59 million in second quarter revenue, despite continued COVID impact to new patient starts, due to PKU clinics closed or not operating at full capacity. Building on that theme, it is important to note that PKU clinics in the U.S. have not opened up to new patient starts at the rate we anticipated. We are still experiencing net patient growth, noting that new patient starts in the U.S. in the second quarter were lower than we expected. Consistent with expectations, the U.S. was the main contributor of growth in the quarter, driven by U.S. patient increases of approximately 30% year over year. And while we remain optimistic about the growth prospects for Palanzi for the balance of 2021, we expect U.S. PKU clinics to increase new patient starts at a slower pace than originally anticipated. The pandemic impact on Palanzi in the EMEA region remains in effect where we have experienced delays in price, reimbursement approvals, and very little new patient activity. In spite of that, we are making incremental progress, and I continue to expect that we will see more material balance Zeke revenue from this region when PKU clinics have more freedom to operate and start additional patients. Continuing with the PKU franchise, Cuban contributed $79 million in revenues in the second quarter, an increase compared to the first quarter of this year, and reflects two factors. First, slower than expected erosion to generics, and second, a rebound from the seasonal dip in demand for Cuban in Q1 that we typically experience. Cuban net product revenues decreased by 36% year over year, primarily due to the U.S. loss of market exclusivity in October 2020, as anticipated. Despite the impact of these challenges, as I mentioned, we are raising the bottom of the range of full year revenue guidance for Kuban. And now turning to Box Zogo, our next potential commercial opportunity and potentially the largest launch to date. As JJ said, we are so pleased to have received the positive CHMP opinion for treatment of children two years old through final adult height, given the importance of starting treatment early in achondroplasia. Additionally, receipt of authorization for use or ATU early access program granted in France allows access to Voxogo for those seeking treatment in France. This will give us the ability to get patients started in France imminently. Consistent with our past practice, we will communicate the price for Voxogo once we have an approval. Assuming the upcoming EU decision aligns with the CHMP opinion, which is typically the case, we look forward to potential launch in the third quarter in Europe. Upon that approval, we expect to launch in Germany first, begin the reimbursement process in other large markets, and take advantage of named patient sales opportunities in markets where they exist. As we have shared previously when asked for help modeling Boxogo revenue, 
we are targeting annual net per patient revenue that is more like Palenzeek than enzyme replacement therapy like. Turning to commercial supply, we anticipate the release labeled finished goods will be ready to ship to customers in key markets such as Germany, France, Italy, and the United States within four to eight weeks of an approval. Teams are currently in place and well prepared for what could be Biomarin's largest brand yet. We look forward to sharing more detail on launch plans, pending potential approvals over the coming weeks in Europe and in November in the United States. In conclusion, results in the first half of 2021 exceeded our expectations and reinforced the essential nature of our commercial brands to the people who rely on them. Despite typical uneven ordering patterns, demand for our products in the more than 75 countries where we do business is robust. Biomarine to execute seamlessly and looks forward to new product launches around the world over the coming quarters, should timing of approvals align with our expectations. Thank you for your attention, and I will now turn the call over to Hank to provide an R&D update. Hank? Thanks, Jeff. Beginning with Voxogo for the treatment of children with achondroplasia, we were thrilled to announce the positive CHMP opinion in the quarter, paving the way for potential European approval in this quarter. We were also pleased that the positive opinion recommended treatment with Voxogo for children ages two and above, a broader group than we had anticipated, given the importance of starting treatment as early as possible. We appreciate the European Medicines Agency recognize how important early treatment is given the window of time when Boxogo can provide a clinical benefit. In the United States, two results from the phase three extension study to supplement the new drug application are under review, and we look forward to the PDUFA target action date of November 2021. Boxo is the first medi- Boxogo is the first medicine that addresses the root cause of achondroplasia and is potentially the first medicine to be approved for children with achondroplasia. I would like to convey our gratitude to the families, the advocacy groups, investigators, and colleagues who have supported the development of Boxogo. We're in the cusp of the potential approval of another innovative product that addresses the root cause and tremendous unmet need of a significant pediatric condition. We want to thank everyone who contributed to this important moment. Briefly on Roctavian, regulatory milestones are tracked into plan. We recently announced that the European Medicines Agency had validated our marketing authorization application which could lead to a CHMP opinion in the first half of next year under the accelerated assessment timeline. We're very pleased to be tracking towards potential approval next year in Europe, given the breadth of clinical evidence demonstrating dramatic reductions in bleeding rates, factory utilization, factory infusion rates following with Roctavian. In the United States, we expect to to resubmit the biologics license application for Roctavian in the second quarter of 22, assuming support of two-year data, followed by an expected six-month review procedure. Further supporting the role we believe Roctavian may play in the treatment of severe hemophilia A, last week we're very pleased to have shared 12 presentations at the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis' 2021 Virtual Congress. The three oral presentations and nine posters spanned a variety of relevant gene therapy topics, as well as data updates from both our Pivotal Generate 1 and Phase 1-2 two, two studies with Roctavian. As you may have seen in the updates, the largest and longest development program for any gene therapy in hemophilia A, Roctavian demonstrated continued durable clinical benefit through at least five years. Data from our Pivotal Generate 1 study demonstrated that over 90% of all 134 participants had an annualized bleed rate of either zero or lower than it was uh, at, uh, than their baseline, uh, and reminder that their baseline was collected while they were on best standard of care factory prophylactic therapy. At 5.1 years after receiving a single dose, the 6013 vector genome per kilo dose cohort of the phase one, two study demonstrated that after week four, the mean annualized bleed rate was reduced by 95%. Also of importance to patients when considering the overall benefit from Roctavian in the pivotal generate one study, all but two of the 134 participants remain off prophylactic factor A treatment. And in the phase one, two study for both the 6E and 4E13 dose cohorts, all participants remain off prophylactic factor A therapy through years five and four respectively. What our investigators are telling us that this is no profi, no bleeds. Status is hugely meaningful out- outcome for these uh, 
uh, patients in these studies. We are very encouraged by these results and look forward to the full two-year readout with all 134 participants in early 22, the basis of our potential U.S. VLA submission in the second quarter of next year. Lastly, we want to extend our thanks to the community, our investigators, and the people who participate in the clinical program. You're making history, and we thank you for your contributions to the body of knowledge in this, uh, in this important new therapy for hemophilia A. Turning now to earlier stage pipeline and beginning with 307 gene therapy for phenylketonuria, the dose escalation portion of the study continues with incoming subjects now receiving the 6013 vector genome per kilogram dose. Based on encouraging signals from the 2E13 vector genome per kilo dose, we look forward to gathering a meaningful amount of data with the 6E dose before determining next steps. To remind you, we're targeting normal fee and normal diet, and we look forward to the readouts from additional subjects given the interest in gene therapy solutions for phenylketonuria. Behind BMN307, we've been concurrently moving a number of our next generation products forward and are pleased to have two, I, to have two active INDs to highlight today. Last week, our IND for BMN331 gene therapy for the treatment of her hereditary angioedema, or HAE, was activated in the United States. HAE is characterized by unpredictable, painful, recurring, and self-limiting uh, acute edematous attacks, which may occur at multiple locations, such as the face, extremities, upper airways, and the GI tract. Laryngeal attacks are the most serious manifestation of HAE, and they can cause fatal asphyxiation due to obstruction of the upper airways. And while standard of care has improved over recent years, HAE patients still require chronic therapy, still experience debilitating, unpredictable breakthrough attacks that require rescue medication. BMN331 is an AAD5-based gene therapy intended to restore the deficiency in circulating levels of the missing or dysfunctional C1S3 inhibitor protein, causing HAE with one-time IV infusion, thereby providing a durable preventive effect against HE tax without the need for regular prophylactic treatments. This will be the first gene therapy clinical trial for the treatment of HAE in the U.S. and Byron's third investigational gene therapy product to the clinic. We're finalizing study protocols and hope to begin dosing participants by the year's end. We are pleased to share that, in addition, BMN255, our small molecule for the treatment of a, chronic, of a subset of chronic renal disease, is in the clinic and we are dosing participants. We've been very productive and somewhat under the radar with these advances, as well as a number of other candidates over the last quarters, and we look forward to sharing a deeper dive on the burgeoning next generation pipeline at our upcoming R&D &D Day in November. Thanks for all your support, and I'll now turn the call over to Brian to update financial results in the quarter. Brian? Thank you, Hank. Please refer to today's press release summarizing our financial results for full details on the second quarter of 2021. As usual, our comprehensive report on the quarter will be available in our upcoming Form 10-Q, which we are on track to file over the next few days. As JJ mentioned, the anticipated timing of revenue and expenses over the course of 2021 resulted in a strong start to the year and the upward revision of full year 2021 total revenue guidance, including Vimazin, Naglazine, and Palanzi, as well as improved GAAP and non-GAAP guidance. With respect to revenues, Jeff mentioned some of the specific markets that placed large orders during the first half of the year in both the first and second quarters. They were concentrated in markets where countries typically place bolus orders, causing unevenness in revenues on a quarterly basis and in 2021, on a first half as compared to a second half basis. Based on these quarterly timing dynamics, we continue to emphasize our full year guidance as the best metric to measure our performance. While we continue to steadily identify and add new patients to each of our commercial products over time, we anticipate that demand for biomarin products will continue to increase in the future, notwithstanding global ordering patterns. Moving to operating expenses, R&D expense for the second quarter was $161 million, which was lower compared to R&D expense of $182 million for the second quarter of 2020, which included an upfront payment to our Dynacor, related to our Dynacor collaboration <laughs> last year. Based on our R&D expense trends through the first half of the year and expectations for the second half of 2021, we have lowered the top end of full year R&D expense guidance by $10 million. Next, with respect to SG&A expense, Q2 2021 SGNA totaled $184 million, which was slightly higher than SGNA expense of $175 million for the second quarter of 2020. We hope to be launching Boxogo globally in the second half of this year, 
which is driving our SG&A expenses to be weighted to the back half of the year. Of note for 2021 is that our SG&A line this year includes some charges for idle plant time of approximately $25 million, mostly related to maintaining our Roctavian manufacturing capability during its continued development cycle. Based on these SG&A drivers in 2021, we are narrowing our full year SG&A guidance by $10 million and further note that we're trending towards the higher end end of the range for SG&A expense. During the bottom line results, we reported gap net income of $13 million in the second quarter of 2021, compared to a gap net loss of $29 million in the second quarter of 2020. Non-gap income of $98 million in the second quarter of 2021 also grew as compared to non-gap income of $57 million in Q2 2020. These bottom line results follow the same circumstances noted earlier. Higher first half 2021 revenues and higher second half 2021 expenses resulted in a strong profit result through the second quarter. If the second half of the year trends that we're expecting hold true, we we predict recognizing a gap net loss and lower non-gap income in the second half of the year. However, back to the full year 2021, we're very pleased to announce the improvements of full year gap and non-gap guidance. We've reduced full year, non, or full year gap net loss by $20 million to between $110 million and $60 million for 2021. Non-gap income full year guidance is now increased to between $190 million and $240 million, representing an increase of $20 million on each side of the range. That substantial level of non-gap income helped generate a continued increase in our total cash and investment as we ended the second quarter of 2021 with 1.47 billion compared to 1.35 billion dollars at the end of 2020. We set a goal of earning positive operating cash flow in 2021. And while the aforementioned timing dynamics also impact cash flows, the business delivered $83 million of positive cash flows from operations in the second quarter and $196 million on a year-to-date basis in 2021. This solid cash position, coupled with our strong operating performance through the first half of the year, is a strong foundation from which to look forward to the potential launch of Boxogo over the next few months and Roctavian next year. And the progress of our early stage pipeline that is leveraging the same R&D organization that developed our portfolio of six approved products and two large market late stage programs is an exciting next chapter in Baumarin's potential future growth story. Thank you for your support. And we'll now turn the call over to your question. Thank you. Operator? As, mm-hmm. as a reminder to ask a question, you'll need to press star one on your telephone. To address a question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question is from Corey Casimov from JP Morgan. Your line is open. Great. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I uh, wanted to ask you about Roctavian. I'm curious if you've been able to get much physician and also payer feedback coming out of IFTH, uh, just given the virtual nature of it and the, the five-year update, particularly in the context of factor eight levels demonstrating a continued decline despite a still very favorable ABR. So basically wondering if this update impacts how they're thinking about the product and the treatment paradigm in any meaningful way. Thank you. Maybe I'll start, Jeff. We'll take him a little bit on the physicians to the payers. Um, You know, it was a virtual Congress, so it's not quite the same thing. You're right, Corey. But, you know, one of the things I was struck by, uh, you know, just sort of at a very high level to clinicians um, and their experience with Roctavian and the patients, they're, they're not very focused on the surrogate markers. They're more focused on the patient right in front of them. And one of the things that struck me was now five years later, what's, what's top of mind for this physician was the liberty that Roctavian afforded their patients. That we think of this as, okay, you just, you know, like just take a few less doses of this other thing. And it's life transformation freedom that these people are experiencing. Now it's five years since they have some vague recollection of having this condition called hemophilia. Uh, And so I think that's pretty profound. And I think that's what's more on people's mind necessarily than, you know, tomorrow's another day. So Jeff, I don't know if you want to add anything from your perspective. Uh, Thanks, Hank. Um, In fact, we haven't had a chance to specifically get out and um, 
check in with payers and physicians and any kind of a formal way since ISTH. There just hasn't been enough time. But a couple of observations I would make um, from some recent uh, uh, prescriber research that we've done in the United States and Germany that follows um, the availability of the full 301 data set through, through one year, generate one uh, data set through one year, is um, a lot of stability in the interest of uh, Roctavian relative to the last time we went out to do this market research uh, two years prior, um, but a significant interest increase in the confidence in the product. And that's probably due to a combination of the, the longer data set from the phase one, two study and the full uh, data set from the generate uh, one study being available. So I find that uh, really encouraging and uh, as you know, Corey, our, our U.S. team has been out uh, talking to payers uh, for a year and a half now, and um, the payers appreciate what, what Hank just mentioned. I think a lot pivots on, uh, on the final durability of, of this drug with patients. The five-year data that we've recently released is certainly supportive of continued durability, and uh, the, the payers we continue to work with on uh, mechanisms in the US and in Europe of being able to address uh, risk of durability in um, managed access agreements or paper performance agreements of one type or another, depending on the market. So I'm really confident uh, as we head into this next round. And again, I mean, That's very to, helpful. Thanks. Besides what, what Jeff and, and Hank say, I mean, the peers, I mean, they don't measure factory levels. They don't. They cannot track them. They're not organized for that. What they look at is how much these patients are costing them every year. And they're costing them north, north of $800,000 a year. So, uh, so right now, we have five years of efficacy. So it's close to $4 million of savings potential for these payers. That's what they look at. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Your next question is from Robin Karnakis from Truist Securities. Your line is open. Hi, team. Thank you for taking the question. Um, just a question on Voxogo. Um, now that you have the European opinion, you're about to get the U.S. opinion. Can you talk a little bit about your latest thoughts on the dynamics amongst the pa patients and the doctors? Um, are you seeing, um, you know, patients or children, um, you know, reaching out for interest in getting the drug and trying to you know, see whether appointments are being available and how are you going to manage that? Um, and then what are you seeing on the, on the awareness side, especially in Europe and the United States, um, now that you're so close to approval, where are you at there? Sort of a similar question um, about uh, Vodogo that you answered for Octavian. Thanks. Maybe I'll, uh, hi Robin, this is Jeff. Maybe I'll take a, a shot at answering this person ask Hank and JJ to round out anything I'm missing. So the, the first thing I would say is um, it's really not possible for us in advance of an approval to be engaging with uh, patients and, and prescribers. So we're very much looking forward to um, getting to the point where, where we can do that. As JJ uh, noted in his remarks, we now have an approved early access program in France. Uh, we just got that and uh, that'll allow us to start treating Patients in Germany uh, will be poised to um, will be poised to launch uh, right after uh, an approval. Should we be so fortunate to get one? Our our market research uh, that we have done to map out kind of the prescriber networks. I, I would start in Europe as saying there are expert centers in most markets in Europe, and we're going to be relying on those expert uh, centers. As, as a first wave of um, uh, prescribing for achondroplasia patients, we would anticipate that patients would migrate from getting started in expert centers to being treated in, in more local uh, areas and eventually having those more local physicians uh, initiate treatment. In the United States, um, uh, we have a team in place today that's been establishing an initial uh, a profiling relationship with a pediatric endocrinologist 
which we expect to be largely the, the base of uh, prescribers in the U.S. So these would be uh, physicians that are quite accustomed to dealing with and prescribing drugs for growth disorders. Uh, we also know that uh, some patients are in genetics clinics, and uh, we have well-established relationships in those genetics clinics in the United States that we can, uh, can and will leverage. Our market research indicates a high degree of interest in, on the part of uh, caregivers. So we're looking forward to getting to that next phase where we can be begin actually selling and promoting. Maybe the only thing I would add is, you know, 80% of the patients are born to parents normal in stature, and this is not a subtle condition. This, this is a big health impacting condition, and they're looking forward very much to improved health. And I would say the evidence that interest and awareness is rising, cresting, as Jeff was just describing, just from the EMA's actions in terms of their recommendation, um, they were willing to extrapolate uh, safety and efficacy data from the pivotal trial in patients older than five to making the product available in children other than five. We, we saw this with Brunura with the EMA as well. The sort of their thinking is no child should be left behind. So I think they recognize the urgency of the condition and the importance of giving Jeff, Jeff's team the tools they need to get this medicine to patients early. And just to clarify, you said 48 weeks of a delay between like an approval time and time you could get drug uh, to a center. Just want to be clear that that's true, like both for the U.S. and Europe. Is how, how do you think about modeling it? That, that's right. So that's getting uh, uh, the Greg's uh, operations team getting final label product um, release, uh, quality released, and into a distribution center where we can ship to customers. So between, Robin, between week, four, four, four weeks, weeks and eight weeks, not 48 weeks. Sorry. <laughs> so, not a year, that's so that that tragic. <laughs> Thank you. Not a year. Although, again, we are going to treat our first patients in France in the next few days. Your next question is from Salvin Richter from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. For Bucks Zogo, do you feel that the FDA views the overall clinical package for approval similarly to the EMA, just given the, the two-year data comment? And also with regard to the EMA's recommendation for a broader age group of, of two years of age and older. Well, as we've talked about it, every health authority has their own sort of unique gloss on it. Um, in the case of the US FDA, we've been transparent all along talking about the fact that their original recommendation was a two year trial. And of course we provided them two years worth of control data on improvement in height velocity. We think we have a really strong package. You know, we're getting really close to the finish line and as typical for bottom line, we're gonna, you know, not get into the sausage making of the later stage discussions with the health authorities, but we, we remain very confident in the package that we submitted. And I think the European action speaks, you know, good volumes to the results of diligent peer review. It might, the perspective might be ever so slightly different, but I think, you know, the main question remains, on balance, do the benefits exceed the risks here? We're pretty confident, um, you know, of the coming actions. Thank you. Your next question is from Josh Micken from Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Uh, I had one on Roctavian, um, and it sort of parallels another question. So as you guys continue to accumulate long-term data, you know, just, you know, a, a, bigger N and, and, and longer follow-up. Are there any themes that you can identify for maybe what characteristics, you know, could predict stable factor eight and, and, long, and longer durability? Or in contrast, you know, what, what could predict maybe a breakthrough bleed or, or shorter durability? I'm just trying to get a sense for maybe, you know, how you could uh, maybe optimize that looking to the commercial uh, launch. Thank you. Yeah, subject of uh, predictability and variability is, comes up a fair amount. Actually, um, the fact that two out of a, only two out of 134 patients that were dosed in the Generate One trial required 
a relatively quick return to prophylactic therapy where 132 out of 134 did not require a return to prophylactic therapy and maintained adequate hemostatic efficacy, I think, goes really well for the predictability of response. Now, not everybody's going to respond in the exact same way. And of course, that's a regular routine issue in medicine. It's relatively easy to manage and monitor in this case in the sense that we don't remove any options for patients. They can always go back to heme lever or factor eight prophylaxis. There's not any, uh, the, the side effect profile as we understand it today seems fairly favorable for that to be a choice that patients can make. Of course, all of this is gonna be subject to the review of the health authorities for their final decision making uh, at the end of the review cycles that we've talked about for the EMA and for the US respectively. Um, all that said, you know, the durability data that we have give us confidence that although it, we don't know exactly where you know things are going to settle out and when they're going to settle out. It does appear to be a large number of years after initial transduction, which I think gives you the platform of belief around what JJ was talking about, which is the commercial value of the product, the platform of what Jeff was believed he was talking about, which is confidence in a product that can you know transform the lives of people. And what my doctor a lot colleagues are telling us are sort of an, a mind-blowing level of difference in the outcome for patients at a clinical level. Yeah, I mean, and again, as Hank said, you know, we have very few patients that don't respond at all, less than 2% based on our current data. So, so obviously, although obviously it's not great news for the patients, I don't know of any therapy that works in 100% of the patients. I mean, even the fantastic COVID vaccine on the market, they have about 90% response rate. And hundreds of millions of patients have been taking them, although 10% of them don't respond. Okay, thank you, guys. Your next question is from Dajit Chattopadhyay from Guggenheim Securities. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. So on Roctavian, post-approval, how do you think physicians are going to decide on steroids? So would it be profi or on demand with close monitoring for the first 12 to 16 weeks? And secondly, assuming a seven to eight year durability, how are you thinking about retreatment, especially on the back of the benign immunogenicity profile of uh, AV5 vectors? Thank you. Yeah, it's a little early to talk about the steroid use in the context of post-approval because we don't have a label yet. <laughs> and so we're just in the early stages of prosecuting that with Europe and, um, and, and we'll begin that process next year with the FDA as we talked about. What I can say about steroids in the post-approval setting is that we have data on both on-demand use of steroids and prophylactic use of steroids in our program. We have data on fairly light touch on-demand steroids and fairly heavy touch on-demand steroids. What, what we've learned out of all of that is that you probably don't need to treat people as hard with corticosteroids in the context of gene transfer. And it might be the case that there are simpler regimens, for example, just a prophylactic regimen from the get-go. And in fact, we have an ongoing study that's enrolling quite nicely. Congratulations to the clinical team uh, for that. And, um, and we'll, we're going to be learning more between now and the eventual product availability that I think will inform, in addition, as I started, the product labels uh, on steroid use. The other part of your question then has now escaped my. Uh, so in the get out my binoculars and think about what's going to happen in the many years from now future when potentially hundreds of patients, we don't know when. You know, we, we're doing a lot of work on the molecular basis of vector loss. And, um, you know, you've heard us talk about in the past, some of this could be liver cell turnover, but some of this could be intrahepatocyte mechanisms that are pretty complicated and tricky. So the good news is that we're trying to learn and we are learning quite a bit about that. So that would inform the design of a next generation vector. Um, and I think it's pretty premature to be thinking about that as a development candidate. Uh, I think about this in a more science context, learning um, uh, and being prepared in the event that there's meaningful loss of vector expression out in the outer years. That, that's still a long ways away for the vast majority of patients. Got it. Thank you. Your next question is from Phil Nadu from Common Company. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. The FDA's um, Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies Advisory Committee recently announced a meeting for early September to discuss the safety of AAV vectors. 
Hank, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that meeting, and then maybe specifically, has Byron been asked to present at the meeting, or, or do you have any plans to um, to make a presentation even during the, the public comments period? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's terrific that the FDA is reaching out to their experts early in the time course of the development of this of these therapies. You know, these these therapies have obvious transformative potential, but uh, as the community likes to refer to, there are still unknown unknowns, and some of the known unknowns that were that, that are the subject of this panel are are important therapeutically now. And, you know, and they've named some of those, you know, integration considerations, thrombotic microangiopathy, for example, ALT or infusion or, or uh, pretty severe hepatic reactions. Um, that we, we've not been asked to present anything. We're going to be watching the discussion just like everybody else, uh, as far as we know, as, as of right now. Um, I mean, the, the thing, the way I think about that is we don't really have a lot to say on that subject because we haven't experienced the kinds of things uh, that the rest of the field has experienced with different capsids. Um, I think a common thing for us to be thinking about could be, is there any read through on product or class specific labeling? I think that's really premature at this point to talk about. The thing that I think we have done that makes our program unique, important, and distinct, or unique and important is that, you know, we have a fairly large data set. So uh, I think a lot of these things are arising in the context of one and two and three patients worth of events. Um, and I think, you know, the accumulation of a large amount of data is really the only formula for advancing knowledge uh, as regards to safety of the AV gene therapy platform. So we're very pleased to have already dosed 134 patients in our phase three trial and following now past one year of follow-up is, is a, represents a pretty exuberant body of accumulating knowledge. So we'll watch uh, as uh, interested spectators. Perfect. Thanks for taking the question. Yep. Your next question is from Paul Matthews from Stiefel. Your line is open. Hey, thanks so much. I had a couple of questions on Vesoratide. I was wondering if you've had any engagement with the FDA on the two-year data and how important you think that is for the FDA in determining durability of effect. And then second, I don't know if it's premature, but I guess there's a couple ways you could think about pricing for this drug in the U.S. One is based on pre uh, prevalence, and the other is kind of looking at growth hormone, which really isn't uh, kind of in the normal orphan ballpark, and th those span a wide range. So I'd be kind of curious, at least in your philosophy, and if those two are the kind of right, right brackets to be thinking about. Thanks. Maybe I'll start on the two-year data, yeah. Paul. The, the, um, I mean, what, what, there's not a lot more to say about that other than that they – flag this as a consideration for discussion at their advisory committee, and we believe that we address the issue of durability not in the exact way that the FDA wanted, but in a way that is robust scientifically for them to come to their conclusions. But as you know, they've reiterated their request. We have provided the data. We are interacting with them about the data, as I mentioned. You know, we're getting close enough to the finish line now that we won't go into the sausage making of the back and forth, but suffice it to say with a Padufa date of a November 20, I think we'll all know the answer to the FDA uh, fairly short, shortly. And we remain confident that that data package addresses the issues of their consideration. That is to say that that Voxogo's effect will accumulate over time, that that, that, that benefit of the natural bone, regulator bone growth will facilitate uh, uh, well-being in all the endochondral bones of the body resulting in both stature gain, but ultimately over time, improvement in their health. I'll start with the pricing and then uh, Jeff can tell you about some bigger research we've done. <clears throat> Again, I think we've stated before and we're reiterating it that we anticipate a pricing here. That would be similar to, uh, uh, to Palenzic, which is uh, around $200,000 a year for patients in the U.S. Uh, and that is based on Famous research and the value proposition that we have here. Uh, I would say growth hormone is not is not a good comparator. Uh, growth hormone insufficiency or deficiencies are is a much much less severe disorder. You're talking about you know two point, uh, around two standard deviations from normal in terms of final adult height. That no associated comorbidities. Uh, we're talking about five to six standard deviations from normal in terms of adult height here. Uh, so much more severe disorder. Uh, which you know puts it in the you know in the in the orphan category, and and this is supported by peer research that Jeff can talk about. Yeah, thanks, JJ. I think you you largely cover it. Um, 
but thinking about uh, uh, Voxogo in the context of the uh, prevalent treatment population, which is is uh, relatively small compared to the population of, of uh, patients that would be eligible for growth hormone. But more importantly, thinking about the uh, the unmet medical need, need in achondroplasia and the potential long-term and lifetime benefits of Voxogo uh, for those patients. We've done a lot of work with payers in both um, Europe and in the United States um, to characterize uh, the, the unmet needs in achondroplasia and to model out uh, what could be uh, benefits from Voxogo beyond what we will be uh, the significant uh, improvements in and durable improvements in uh, growth velocity that are the primary uh, things that we're studying in the phase two and the phase three study. And I think we've made a lot of progress uh, with payers in, in that regard. And, and so as JJ uh, notes, I'm mu much more bullish about the prospects uh, for pricing than, uh, than in the context of growth hormone pricing. And also on top of it, here we're going to have no competition for many years to come, at least, at least five or six years, if, if not more. Growth hormone is a very competitive market, including biosimilars. We are quite in the same situation here. Another dynamic. Thanks very much. Your next question is from Gina Wang from Barclays. Your line is open. I have one question regarding Voctavian. Um, any thoughts on possibility that FDA could ask for longer uh, than two year follow up for submission? And if so, when would you expect to hear back from the FDA? <laughs> well, Gina, you know, the FDA can ask for anything they want, anytime they want. And as you've seen before, they can ask for much longer data even after they've communicated the complete response letter as the first object, as the first communication that, uh, execution. I know that's really frustrating um, for uh, everybody. Um, you know, they're, they have a lot of uh, excuses about that. I, I think our side, you know, we can't control, you know, what the FDA does and we can't control COVID and things like that. What we can do is we can generate a lot of data and try to de develop the best possible drugs we can with the strongest evidence packages. And I think that, um, you know, judging by the fact that the European agency is willing to get their application review started with the one-year data, knowing full well that the two-year data is around the corner again also, I think bodes well for how a health authority can look at the accumulating package of information, even with uncertainties remaining about longer-term durability. And I think the agency is, you know, has, has been fairly clear about um, the time, the U.S. FDA has been fairly clear about wanting the two-year data. It's not, it's not driven so much by any worries they have about the data or what they've seen so far because they've seen the same things you've seen. Uh, well, actually, they, they, they haven't gone in probably in as much depth on the one-year data as you have. They just made up their mind they want the two-year data. So I'm optimistic that that will get them there in, a, you know, in terms of a positive benefit risk. I think if you step back and say, two years ago, I got a single infusion of something, and two years later, I'm still not suffering the underlying condition that I was you know, originally diagnosed with, I think is, you know, it's reasonably profound, but let's, you know, let's just keep our fingers crossed that that's the way it holds all the way through the next review cycles. And also, we haven't had any communication so far with the FDA that would lead us to believe that they ought to require more than two years. But I think they can always change their mind. Okay. I think the reason I'm asking because we saw the reason, you know, Unicure can be updated, you know, shortly before submission. So just want to make sure uh, similar things will not year. happen. Except Unicure was just planning on submitting one year and understand they asked for 18 months. So there were still below 24 months for Unicure. Okay, great. Thank you. Your next question is from Joseph Swartz from SVB Lyrank. Your line is open. Hi, I'm Jerry Zalian for Joe. Thanks for taking our question. So our question is on Voxogo. Um, how confident are you that you understand all the influencers and influences in the achondroplasia market? So, for example, the adoption of Kuvan was influenced by dietitians that needed to be convinced of the merits of the drug. 
So ahead of Voxo was launched, our question is how confident are you that you have a handle and buy-in from all the stakeholders that matter that will be important for widespread adoption of the product? <clears throat> well, thank you for that question. That, that's a good one. Um, in fact, we have a, we have a commercial model um, that, that includes in, uh, paying attention to the, the different stakeholders um, that are likely to influence the entire range of commercial decisions. We call it our five P's model. And um, those include uh, patients and advocates, politicians, uh, physicians, and payers. And so we pay attention to all of those influencers. In terms of a degree of confidence, um, you know, each of those groups is not a monolithic uh, thing. There are different individuals. Uh, some are more bullish, some are more skeptical. Some are early adapters, some are later adapters. So there's a, a variability inside of there as it relates, for example, to uh, patient advocacy organizations. You know, depending on where you're standing in the world, some are uh, really excited about um, having a treatment option, others less so. Same thing with uh, same thing with payers. So I think that we're reasonably confident uh, in our ability to pull off a strong commercial launch starting in Europe and hopefully later this year in the United States, um, you know, a hundred percent assurance is, is probably not something that I could promise you. Yeah. I mean, although, although again, I think, um, you know, there is a lot of excitement about the drug in many parts of the world here based on the feedback we're getting from our commercial organization. Uh, as you know, in some countries like Italy and Spain, I think around 80% of patients, undergo limb extension surgery, uh, which is dangerous, painful, and expensive. Uh, so that gives you an, an idea as to whether they really want to, you know, uh, grow a little faster than they're growing right now, uh, if they're willing to do these things. Uh, and here we are offering something that's way more elegant than that limb extension surgery, which only impacts one or two bones of their bodies. Uh, so, uh, we, we are not too concerned here. I think the, the patient demand is going to be there. And also, as Hank said earlier, I think 80% of uh, echinoplasia patients are born from patients that are from parents that are unaffected by the disorder, and the vast majority of them uh, are interested in uh, in growth velocity and uh, and final adult height for their kids. Um, and indeed, that there are a few patients, but it's a minority. I mean, a few patients, a few yeah, echinoplastic. Uh, people uh, that uh, you know might be less interested in the in the product, but they are not they are not eligible for the product because basically all of them are adults. So we're not counting them on our forecast anyway. Next question is Michelle Gilson from Canaccord Genuity. Your line is open. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I, I have one quick one and, um, and one more robust question. I guess the fir first being, has the FDA seen the five-year data on factor eight activity for Valrox or Roctavian and reiterated their guidance to you for two years of data from the Generate study uh, to file? And then the, the second also on, on Roctavian, you know, it, it seems like the first market you'll be launching into is Europe. And, you know, based on some European KOL feedback we've gotten, it really seems like KOLs overseas are expecting maybe one or two gene therapies at most uh, for hemophilia A to be reimbursed um, and for the government to really be the deciding, um, uh, the, the deciding factor in determining which gene therapy is going to be available. I guess with respect to this dynamic and, and your experience marketing in Europe, how important is it to be the first mover there? And maybe if you could comment a bit on your expectations around both the near and long-term um, expectations for, for uh, Roctavian um, uptake in the region. Oh, sorry. Well, Josh, warming up in this local courts. The uh, five-year data press release, the FDA is aware of it. I, I have no idea whether they went to the presentations, actually. Um, but they had reiterated their demand for the two-year data before the one-year data was seen, and there was no point in them reiterating their demand after the five. I and mean, we knew what their request was going to be, even if we'd asked them. So 
the, the five-year, the availability of the five-year data did not change the dialogue that we had. And maybe circling back then to your question about uh, Europe and payers and preferences for one or, or more gene therapies, um, Roctavian is substantially ahead of uh, competitive, potential competitive programs. So um, I, you're exactly right. Having first mover advantage in, in Europe and in the United States comes with many, many, many advantages. Um, uh, first, uh, when, you know, assuming, assuming an approval on the kind of timelines that we've been planning, there, there is no second uh, uh, approved program. There is no viable uh, in the wings second program. And if there was, that program would have uh, less durability data. We know they're going to have less um, robust data sets in terms of numbers of patients. Uh, by, by the time that happens, BioMarin will be well into life cycle management initiatives, exploring a, other aspects of the treatment of Roctavian for, for, um, for hemophilia A. So I think you're exactly on the money thinking that a first mover advantage is uh, so valuable in so many different ways for um, Roctavian. And we're really bullish about the kind of uptake prospects uh, in terms of treating patients that come along with that and noting that once those patients are treated with Roctavian, they're off the table for potential uh, later entrance to the market. So thanks for uh, shining a light on that. Yeah, so again, once they've been treated with Roctavian, they cannot be treated with another gene therapy. Uh, it's with an AV vector, which is basically all the ones that are in development right now. Uh, <clears throat> so that's obviously a major first mover advantage. That uh, that uh, that we will have as compared to uh, our competitors. Um, so we are, you know, again, pretty excited by it. Uh, and also, one other aspect which is important is that our vector AV5 has the lowest, uh, basically, the lowest prevalence of any other AV vectors in terms of pre-existing antibodies, which is also an advantage we have against our competitors. Your next question is from Kenan McKay from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for uh, sque squeezing us in. Just a quick pipeline question. For BMN307, wondering if you could sort of give us an update on uh, additional patients that have been dosed here, if you've dosed beyond sort of that lowest dose. And, and within that program and, and that fearless study, uh, just what you're looking for during dose e escalation, essentially with, with a, a, a vector like this, um, how and, and a disease uh, like this, how do you um, decide on a on a go forward uh, dose when you know more, more reduction is better in in being lowering? Thank you. Yeah, the um, we are in fact at a second dose level, so we've dosed uh, patients at uh, the first entry dose level of the study, which was 13 vector genome for kilo. Um, we saw some signs of fee lowering efficacy, so it says to us that we're probably on the dose response curve. On the basis of that, we elevated the dose in the next group of patients. We haven't communicated the data but what we, from that next group of patients, but what we have communicated is that based on what we've seen in the TUI group and based on what we've seen with Roctavian, we're encouraged to think that it's possible that the 6E group would be the group that we choose to dose expand. You know, as regards how do you pick a dose, I mean, the target of therapeutic effectiveness effectively is normal fee, normal diet. So the dose that, give, the dose that gives that result in, uh, as you know, the, the largest fraction of the population tested is going to be the dose. And as soon as we uh, meet the criteria for dose cohort expansion and move into the registration phase, we'll, we'll take you through the data in particular and, and illustrate why we chose that dose um, to believe that that was a dose that was going to give us the right target uh, uh, product profile. Um, so that's very much right in front of us, and, and we look forward to sharing those data when they're available. All right, thank you. Yep. Your next question is from Matthew Harrison from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Um, great. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. I was just hoping, Jeff, that maybe you could comment a little bit on, in more detail, some of the um, PKU center dynamics you were talking about and how much visibility you have into uh, the flow of patients coming back or the flow of patients coming into those centers and, 
and sort of how confident you are in a in a second half recovery there. Thanks, Matt. Um, in fact, uh, particularly in the United States, where our biggest business is the biggest, we have a lot of visibility into um, how the the different centers are are operating um, to the extent that they are open or not. If they are open, to what percent of their previous capacity, whether or not they're um, they're uh, doing work through telemedicine or not, most of them are, and uh, what kind of um, wait times for patients that are looking to get started on, on Pal and Zeke uh, therapy. So we've got a lot of intelligence. What I would say is the, uh, by and large, the PKU clinics are operating uh, to some level and they are um, starting new patients. Um, they're just not starting them at the pace that would look like the pace that they were starting new patients uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, so, so that's our that's our issue. As as we noted, we have really nice year over year growth of palliative patients on on therapy uh, by the end of the second quarter. Um, had it not been for the pandemic, you know, that rate of growth I, I can confidently say would have been substantially higher. And we know that there is a patient population out there that's interested in getting on to Pal and Zeke. And, um, and so we've been, you know, we've been optimistic as, as the pandemic has kind of slowed in the United States in particular, that these centers would be able to get back up and running. Um, degree of confidence in the second half, um, well, given developments with the Delta variant and, you know, the, the CDC announcement yesterday, I would say, um, you know, I'm still optimistic, but not, not really highly confident. In Europe, it's more of a mixed bag, um, depending on the market that we're talking about. Um, you know, Europe, Europe has had been on a different path. I'm, I'm optimistic, uh, but not 100% confident that we'll be able to get uh, more patients started in our key markets in, in Europe in the second half. So that being said, net net, we are raising the guidance of Kuva and Palinzi by $10 million each. We have reached the end of the Q&A session, and we will now turn a call back to Biomarine CEO and Chairman, JJ Bionime. So thank you all uh, for joining us today. So as we've described, uh, Biomarine is on uh, the cusp of our next uh, significant stage of revenue growth, uh, our solid cash position, uh, foundational base business, two significant market opportunities, and with four potential approvals on the horizon, starting with the potential approval of Voxogo, or likely approval of Voxogo in Europe next month, and a, and a robust early stage pipeline that we have been advancing steadily over the last quarters. This sets up for a transformation, transformational growth uh, beginning in 2022. So thank you for your attention today, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you uh, again soon. Thank you for joining Goodbye. today's conference. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.